Good morning, Real Life Church, and happy Easter. Welcome to Church Online. If it's your first time joining us, my name is Raul. And I'm Stacy, and we are so excited because it's Easter. Easter Sunday. We're so glad you're here. So if you are joining us for the first time, this is how it's going to work. We're going to sing a song, maybe two, and then we'll be back to tell you some things. If you join us all the time, welcome back. Yes. We'll see you right after worship.
Welcome back. Thank you so much to our incredible worship team for helping us get our hearts ready for what we're going to learn. If you really like music, as we do as a church, uh, we have an exciting event coming up on May 20th. We don't have a lot of details except to say... It's a concert (laughs) outside at our Glendora campus. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have incredible uh, teams that are going to be there, musicians who are going to be there. So we want to invite you, wherever you're watching from, if you can drive out to California and watch (laughs) us if you're joining us online. But May 20th concert outside at Real Life Glendora Campus. Yes, and if you are wondering what kind of concert, we're actually going to be hosting an album release party for Neon West. And if you are not familiar with them, you're going to want to get familiar with them. They are really good friends of ours, and we are so excited to support them. Yeah, great people, great music. It's going to be a lot of fun, so bring the whole family. We cannot wait to see you guys there on May 20th. Yes, and then... Before that, this Saturday, in fact, we are hosting our pantry that we host every other Sunday in a second, not Sunday, Saturday, second and fourth Saturdays of the month that takes place at our Glendora campus. All you need to do is show up if you would like to help. I'm going to tell you about that. But if you know someone who could use some food support in this season, send them our way. We are there on the second and fourth Saturday, 10 to noon-ish. Um, but yeah. if you want to get involved, you go to... Real slash pantry. It'll give you all information on there. Again, like Stacey was saying, it's the second and fourth Saturday of every single month at our Glendora campus. So if you want to serve or you know someone who needs to be served, we are there for you every single other every other Saturday at our Glendora campus for our food pantry. Yes. And we are so excited that summer is around BBS. the corner. Yes. Oh my gosh, so much fun. If you have anyone who has little kids or know a family has little kids, this is the place to send your kids for the summer. Kids' lives are changed. I've seen kids ask for prayer. I've seen kids accept Jesus for the very first time because of VBS and their lives are changed forever. So we get to see kingdom, the kingdom changed because of VBS. So we're super excited for that. I'm excited. <laughs> Stacey's really excited because she I gets am. to put it on for everyone. It's so much fun. It is one of our favorite weeks of the entire year. So you can go to reallife.la slash VBS for all the information. And if you are a student, you know a student leader that would love to serve, those applications open today, it's live, right fun. now. It's yes. a lot of fun. So sign up. If you have a young adult, if you have a teenager in your home watching this, have them come serve at VBS. Their lives will be changed as well, serving the next generation as well. Absolutely. And thank you so much, church, for supporting things like the pantry and VBS and throwing big parties concert, like having yeah. the concert. We couldn't do this without you being supportive, inviting people in, praying, but also the way that you give so generously. If you are wondering what it looks like to partner with the church, email us anytime, info at reallife.la. But if you are ready to start giving, how do we do that? Super simple. Go to reallife.la slash give. It'll talk you through all the steps. And we do that, not just as have fun and throw concerts, but to see life change. VBS takes a lot of people. It takes a lot of resources to buy the materials and the snacks and the foods and to have incredible teams here to lead kids in worship. Um, We do those things to see kids' lives change forever for Christ Jesus. So thank you so much for partnering with us in that way. Feel no obligation to partner with us, but we just pray as God continues to move in the life of real life. Absolutely. And then we are now ready to hear the big Easter message. And Pastor Jim, we'll see you right here after that.
Good morning and God bless you. If you're visiting for the first time today, I'm Jim, I'm your pastor. Welcome to Real Life and Happy Easter. This is a great celebration in the life of the church. It's probably the biggest holiday in the church. We make a big deal out of Christmas, but the fact that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead is the heart of our message. And so Easter is a big celebration. If you are over on the Glendora campus this morning, let me hear you say Happy Easter. Yeah, we can hear that over here, so that's good, well done. And uh, if you're in the chapel at Valley Center, let me hear you say Happy Easter. Great, 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 that's good. (laughs) <laughs> All right, God bless y'all. I am so thankful for, for this church and for the way that God's love has shined through this church. I'm thankful that our pantry is now going up and strong. If, if, you, know, uh, if you need groceries, if you know someone who needs groceries, if you want to help distribute groceries, that's twice a month, second and fourth Saturdays of the month. Uh, it is a, it's just a great sign that the church who believes in the living God is out to provide resources for people in need and care for people all around us. And uh, again, I'm just relishing the fact that God's hand has been on us since the beginning of our church and uh, continues uh, in that way. This last week, uh, a patio heater was stolen off uh, the patio at our Glendora campus. And uh, before I even knew it was gone, somebody from the congregation texted me and said, hey, can you use a few patio heaters, uh, outdoor patio heaters? And I looked around and realized ours had just been stolen that night. And uh, I said, yeah, we absolutely could. And he said, in that case, I'm bringing you 12. And uh, it's just like God to provide for us 12 times what the world takes from us. And so I'm thankful that God's hand has been on this church and God continues to bless this church. Let's, uh, let's take a minute, let's pray together and then we'll get into our study of the text for today and Easter morning. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you love us and that you provide for us. When we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, you add to us everything we need and more. God, help us to live in the freedom of your gospel and your good news. Help us to live in the light of the resurrection. Help us not to live in fear or anxiety or anger or all the things that this world stores, uh, stirs up in us. Instead, help us to live for you today. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, there's an ancient Greek myth about a man named Sisyphus. And Sisyphus in the ancient Greek mythology was punished by the gods for giving immortality to humanity. And their punishment for him was a tricky one. He was forced to roll a boulder up a hill only to get near the top and have the boulder roll back down again. And then he had to go back down and get it and to roll the boulder back up again. And this was the the punishment that he was supposed to be stuck in an eternal uh, regress of pushing this boulder up the hill and having it roll back down again. Pushing up the hill and having it roll back down again. Well, there's another boulder in history that was rolled into place, but that just wouldn't stay where it was supposed to be. And that was the boulder rolled in front of the tomb of Jesus. You can imagine that day, Joseph of Arimathea carrying the wilted body of their Messiah, his mother, Jesus' mother, following along behind, weeping because her child had died. He would have placed the body in the cold tomb and pulled away the wedge that allowed the stone to roll into place, keeping the living separate from the dead, keeping that place sacred. It would have felt so final. And that sound in the ears of Mary must have must have felt like thunder. But that boulder just wasn't going to stay in place. Throughout history, people have tried to roll the boulder back into place over and over again. The the women showed up at the tomb on that Easter morning to find the boulder rolled away and Jesus missing because he had risen. But throughout history, people have tried to roll that boulder back in front of the tomb to say, Jesus isn't real, or you don't need him, or you can't know enough to believe in him. Let's roll the boulder in place and keep him locked away. Well, just like the the stone of Sisyphus, that boulder will not stay in place. Uh, Mockery has tried to to roll that boulder into place. There was a a French philosopher, a French novelist uh, named Albert Camus, who wrote a book called The Plague about a disease that spread around the world and killed lots of people. The book has sold really well in the last couple of years again. Uh, and he, he wrote this story. Uh, in The two main characters in the book are uh, a doctor and a priest. And the doctor is trying to cure the disease, and the priest is trying to care for people who are struggling with the disease. And spoiler, spoiler alert, in the course of the novel, the priest dies. And the doctor writes on the, on the priest's medical chart, case doubtful. And that was Camus' way of mocking the faith and saying the case 
for belief in God is doubtful. But Camus, through the course of his life, continued to refer to Jesus as his friend. He just couldn't let go of this, this hope, this belief that there was something more to life. Something in his heart just wouldn't let that boulder stay in place in front of the tomb. There may have been people in your life who have made fun of your faith or, or ridiculed religion, and you've, you've just kind of bought into that mockery. It, it pushes the, the boulder in the way of Jesus, making you feel like there's no way to access him. But that boulder is just not going to stay in place. Mockery tries to roll the boulder of the tomb of Jesus back in place. So do our mistakes. Our mistakes try to put that boulder in place. The things that we've done wrong in our lives may, th may make us think that God would just pass over us disinterested because we're too broken to deserve his grace. I know that on Easter, people come to church who haven't been to church in a long time. You get dragged along by somebody in your family who just wanted you to go with the family today. I know who you are sitting by the back door. I see you there. And, and, and you think, well, I've, I've, I've lived the kind of life that would make God not want anything to do with me. My mistakes have rolled that boulder back in place in front of the tomb. But listen. Listen. There's nothing that Jesus wants more today than to extend grace and forgiveness to us. He literally died for us. He wants us to know today, this morning, that we are forgiven. And nothing, nothing will stop him from wanting to resume relationship with us, to take us back in, to embrace us and forgive us. Mockery can try to roll the boulder back in between us and Jesus. Our mistakes can do it. Our mistakes can try to push the boulder back in between us and Jesus. And our mortality can make us seem far away from God. The fact that we are going to die makes it seem like so much of life is futile. So much of life is a wandering after pointless achievements that will all be eradicated by death. And for some people, the fact that we die makes God a distant and unrealistic kind of thing. I remember one time I had a, a Sunday school class of teenagers and I, I had them in church on a Sunday morning and I took them out on the front lawn in front of the church and I had made a big mud puddle in, in the ground, on the ground in, in front of the church and I had the teenagers take off their shoes and march through the mud puddle. And I told them, now, if there is no God, all of life is just an accident that's bubbled up out of the mud and in the end when we die to the mud we return. If, if all there is is a, a physical world, then our lives are utterly meaningless in the end. And for some people, that, that meaninglessness makes them dismiss God or write God off or assume that there's nothing God can do about our broken lives. But listen, Jesus rose from the tomb on Sunday morning and the stone was rolled away. It, if there's anything that stands between us and Jesus this morning, the, the mockery of the world, the, the guilt of our own mistakes, or our fear of mortality, there's nothing more that Jesus wants to do than to set us free. I'll, I'll, I'll show you how he explained it to the disciples in those early days, right at the beginning. This is in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, at verse 33. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened thinking they saw, saw a ghost. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. I am. Some English Bibles translate this last sentence poorly and they say, it is I myself. But in the Greek, it's two words. I am. And when Jesus says that, he is hearkening back to the identity of God identified in the book of Exodus to Moses more than a thousand years before Jesus. There's this, this moment in the life of Moses where God appears out of a burning bush. God speaks out of a burning bush and says, Moses, 
You're going to go and declare freedom to my people who are in slavery. You're going to set them free from slavery in Egypt. And Moses is inadequate. He doesn't feel like he can do that. And he says, well, if they ask me who sent me, what am I supposed to say? And God gives this powerful and lasting response. Tell them, I am sent you. Tell them, I am who I am. There is nothing that can identify God but him himself. There's nothing to which we can appeal beyond God to identify God. God is the foundation of all being, the source of creation, the one who sustains our life. And if you ask him who he is, the best answer he can give you is, I am. I am sent you, uh, God says to Moses. This line is what gets Jesus in trouble at the end. Because in Mark 14, you'll see that he's charged with blasphemy because he's brought before the the authorities in the end and they ask him, are you the Messiah? And Jesus replies, I am. And when he does that, he's not just saying yes. He's identifying himself with the God who spoke out of the burning bush, the God of all eternity. I am. At this, the the high priest rips his cloak in disgust, in offense at this blasphemy. And this is what gets Jesus handed over to be crucified in the end. Jesus identifies himself with the God who is. The God of Abraham, the God of Moses, and the God of David. So when Jesus comes on the scene, he is doing something that no one had been able to do before. He is identifying who God is. He is showing them a picture of God because he is God incarnate, God in the flesh. It's like this. When I was a kid, I wasn't sure what I wanted to be when I grew up. It was hard to envision myself in a job. I mean, when you're young, when you're little, you know, it's the, the adult world is kind of a mystery and it's hard to imagine yourself being in a, a job somewhere. And so, so I remember being confused and unsure and I thought, well, maybe I'll, be a, maybe I'll be a businessman like my dad or maybe I'll be a professor because I had spent my life in school. And then the time came where I, I joined a church youth group in my teen years and I saw a youth pastor who loved this group of teenagers in a way that I had not seen anywhere else in the world. And he talked about things that were meaningful. He made life count. And I remember looking at him and thinking, maybe I I could do that. Because he he made the, the world of work and profession into something tangible, something I could see. Well, that's what Jesus does with God. Jesus makes God tangible. Jesus makes God something we can see. If you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what God thinks, listen to Jesus. If you want to know how God feels about you, look at the love that Jesus has for you. The one who died on the cross to pay for your sins and rose from the dead to set you free to new life. That's who God is. And Jesus, unlike anyone else in all of history, can say confidently, that's who God is. I am. He is the one who makes God clear to us. Right? Right is the real life version of amen. Right? It's, uh, it's like that moment where you sit in the, uh, in the eye doctor's chair and they switch those little lenses back in front of you and they say the, the first one or the second one? The th- third one or the fourth one? And you, they took, put blurry lens in front of blurry lens in front of your eyes until all of a sudden they click the right ones into place and you can see clearly. And you say, that one, that's it. That's what Jesus does for us. He makes God clear to us because he is the I am. Jesus appears on Easter morning, appears uh, risen from the dead, and he goes to his disciples and he begins to reveal himself to them one at a time. Uh, they're, They're mystified. They're shocked. They don't know what to make of this. And Jesus says, come here, look. Look at the holes in my hands and my feet. I am. The Roman response to him is, no, you're not. We will not have someone come in and upset the empire. We will not have someone come in and pose as a king. We've already got a king. 
You don't get to overthrow him. They dragged him through the streets of Jerusalem. They beat and tortured him. They ridiculed him and they crucified him dead. As he stood dying on the cross, they said to him, if you're the Messiah, get yourself down. No, you're not. They put a sign on the cross over his head that said, the king of the Jews, ridiculing him. No, you're not. And there was a weekend where it seemed like they were right. Imagine the darkness of that Saturday. Jesus' body in the tomb. The disciples scattered their hope for a new kingdom leveled. There was a weekend where it seemed like the voices of this world that say he is not the king were right. How appropriate that when Jesus appears to them, he says, why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. I am. And there's nothing more that Jesus wants to say to you in your life this morning than I am. Because there are all kinds of things that make us think that there is a boulder that stands between us and God. That the, the mockery of our, our families or our community or our world is enough to keep us separate from God. That uh, the mistakes that we've made in life are enough to make God pass over us. That the, the mortality that we face renders all of life meaningless and pointless. But in the midst of your struggles, when, see, when things seem the worst, it is at that point that Jesus will once again show you that no boulder gets to stand between you and him. It's in the moments of our worst tragedy that Jesus wants to stand before us and say, don't forget, I am. Because there will be, there will be mockery in this life. People will always ridicule Jesus. People will ridicule the Christian faith. And that, that is a, a challenge we're always going to face. A century ago, a philosopher named Bertrand Russell predicted that the Christian church would die out by the end of the 20th century. <laughs> and here we are. Here we are. In real life, not only, not only are we still here after a, after a pandemic that leveled so much, we, we're now on two campuses, right, Glendora? We're on two campuses. We, we've opened to a second location. And on top of that, we, we've expanded our ministries. We now have a pantry where we give away food to people in need every month. We, we took in a Japanese congregation that got, got kicked out of their location and didn't have a place to worship. We took them in for free so that they could worship too. There will always be those who ridicule the Christian faith. But in the, the face of their ridicule, the God of all creation will stand in front of those who mock and say, you can say whatever you want to, but in the end, I'm going to have the last word. And the last word is this, I am. We can, we can fear that our mistakes will make him pass over us, that he won't want to get near us, that if we enter a church, the roof is going to cave in because we've been that broken. But listen, the early Christian church in those first days would gather on Easter morning like this. They'd gather at sunrise. And those who were there to be baptized, those who were new believers, would turn towards the west where the darkness was receding. And they would stare into the, the blue and purple hues of the, the receding darkness. And they would renounce sin and evil. And then they would turn to the east where the sun was rising. And they would embrace the risen sun. And no mistakes would keep them from that. No sins or brokenness would stand between them and Jesus. On, on that day, Jesus wants us to embrace him. If you've come to a place in your life where you are afraid of God because you don't know what he would think of you, look at Jesus. Look at the one who absolutely recklessly loves you, who died for you so that you could be free, who doesn't want you to carry guilt the rest of your life. Look at Jesus, who says in the face of that, that boulder of your mistakes, that doesn't get to stay there. You may think he will never forgive you, but to that, Jesus says, I am, I am the one who forgives you. 
If you've never come to that place before where you've made the decision to follow Jesus, you can do it right now in the quiet of your heart. You can say, Jesus, come into my life. I want my life to belong to you. I wanna follow you. I wanna be one of your disciples. Make that decision today. Today is the best day to do it. We've got a baptism scheduled after the 11 o'clock service. You can be baptized today if you're ready. Make that decision. Don't let the day go by. We can be afraid that the the mockery of the world will stand between us and Jesus. We can be afraid that the mistakes that we've made would stand between us and Jesus. And ultimately, mortality can make us just afraid that life isn't worth it. And, And it's not hard to see that after the last couple of years. Because the world is filled with brokenness. The world is filled with disease and war and hatred. And we may look at the the finality of mortality and the, the brokenness of this world, and we may blame God for it. But listen, we're the ones who broke the world, not him. And blaming him for it won't fix it, nor will it put us in a better place. In the face of the brokenness of this world, what we ought to do is pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray and pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then join the movement of Jesus' kingdom, making his love known to the world, giving to those who are in in need, caring for the poor, loving the lost and the lonely. Jesus' kingdom is manifest in us. And rather than sitting around and blaming him for all the brokenness of the world, what a beautiful thing to be invited into the restoration of the world. Walking alongside the God of the whole universe, the one who walked among us, to say, I am. I am going to overcome sin and death. If you've, if you've come to this place where you're, you're considering Jesus again for the first time, Easter tends to do that. If you're coming to that place where you you haven't darkened the doors of a church in a while and you're thinking about it, don't miss what's to come in the next few weeks. We're going to dive into a, a new teaching series next week looking at the freedom and confidence that we have in the gospel. If after the last two years you feel like you have been robbed of your freedom and confidence, look to the God who will restore to you 12 times what has been stolen from you. Don't settle for a, a mediocre faith. A a, a wishy-washy faith in the God who walked among us. Instead, turn your life over to him now and live for the kingdom that will change the world. Don't be afraid that that boulder is in place in front of his tomb. It rolled away 2,000 years ago and nobody's been able to put it back. If you'll join his kingdom today, I guarantee you that the day will come where you stand before him and you hear him say in utter clarity, I am. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for Easter, and I thank you for what you did and what it means to us. And I ask that you would set us free. For those today who are afraid, uh, uh, afraid of the ridicule of the world, afraid of the the guilt of the mistakes that they've made, or afraid of the, the brokenness of this life, Jesus, set them free. May we look to the empty tomb and realize you're not there anymore. May we live in the freedom of the God who rose from the dead, conquering sin and death, and calling us to freedom. God, put that faith in our hearts right now. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and happy Easter. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Thank you for joining us in this incredible journey today. Easter is this amazing time that we get to celebrate all that God has done for us, that he's going to continue to do in our lives. If today's message was particularly uh, meaningful to you, if it made you think of someone who could use the reminder that God is absolutely still in control, that he loves you, and that Jesus wins. Go ahead and share this message with someone. Super simple. I like copying, pasting the YouTube link and a text Mm -hmm. message and saying, hey, at this point of the service, Pastor Jim said something really awesome. So share with your friends, post it on Facebook. We're here for you. If you have any prayer requests, email us. Info at reallife.la. One of us here will respond back to you. We look forward to seeing you next week online.